no? Down. Thank you. It's like rain now. No. It's like a mini game. <laughs> Taking ah, turns. No. Hey. These are my people, heavy. Yeah. So yeah. I've seen them uh, featuring on Instagram quite. Yeah. yeah. Ziggy is four years old. Mm -hmm. I've had him since. Um, that's terrible. I can't count four years back. <laughs> 2016. Yes. <laughs> Should be the easiest. Or 15. Year to I don't know. 15. Okay. Yeah. So welcome to the show. Thank you. A legacy, of which you've created a very solid foundation. At uh, have you even turned 30 yet? I turned 30 this year in November. In November. Yeah. yeah. So final few months of. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty scary actually. It's a new decade. 30 is supposed to. Now I, uh, now I'm an adult for real. For real. <laughs> it's. I can no longer go along with that young guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. And so much has been done, literally from. 22, 23, or have you just been 17. on it from 17? From 17. What was yes. happening at 17? I finished high school when I was 17, uh, just a few months before I turned, because my birthday is in November, so just before I turned um, I turned 18 is when I finished high school. Mm -hmm. Then I had to wait like a month, I think, uh, before I was 18. And I worked from day one, so it's been 17 years. Uh, I went on my first film set before I had my ID, mm -hmm. uh, which was Inspector Muller. I hope those clips never surface. <laughs> Someone is probably <laughs> going to look for them now. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> and you said you were boom swinging? No, so I went, the first gig I got on Inspector Mola was, a cousin of mine worked, worked for Inspector Mola as a soundman or something. So the first gig I got was an extra. I used to play a truant high school kid. Mm. So you know the way Inspector Mola works is every episode is independent of each other. Yeah. And so th they had these scenes where they had, you know, a truant kid was drunk, a truant kid was stolen the mother's money or stuff like this. So I played a, p a bunch of episodes. But that wasn't very sustainable, so because the thing about extras is I would only get called when, when there was something. Yeah. And how often does Inspector Mola feature high school kids? Not often. So then I got the on on a, on a film set or any TV set. There's the hierarchy of the lowest you can get. Mm -hmm. So the lowest you can usually get is a is an extra. Mm -hmm. The next lowest is is a runner, and then after that is a boom singer. So I was extra. I couldn't get runner. Because on that set, the runner was actually higher than the boom singer, so then I got boom singer. <laughs> uh, and I was a boom singer for quite a few years uh, on, 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 on Inspector Mwala, on Nocturnal Junction, on Machachari. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at that point, did you have any of these production ambitions, or were you just yes, trying to... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you, you knew what you were doing. That's why I was moving from, yeah. from, from extra to, uh, to boom singer. And to I wanted to really climb up. Then eventually I figured... Uh, I don't want to climb the ladder, I just want to own it. Mm -hmm. So then I started working towards owning the ladder. Because the ideally what I would have done is I'd have grown boom singer, then maybe become assistant di producer, uh, third assistant director who is who's in charge of the, that's the bosses of the extras. Mm -hmm. And then just there's a bunch of places you have to pass and this takes you like 10 years until you get to maybe director level. But then you can just flip the whole thing over and become an executive producer, which means you start your own gig like you're mm -hmm. doing. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. And we met at USIU when you were giving a talk mm -hmm. and you were an alumni yeah. of USIU. Yeah. And bootstrapping is clearly a very big part of, of how you kick-started. Yeah. So how did you go about like just funding these small projects here and there before having to pitch them? Because I know you have to self-fund. Yeah. So the first... Um, the first film we did was, was with my friend Dexter. And so, of course, these gigs, doing, being a boom singer and all this, they give you a little bit of money. Mm. And while I was doing those, then I joined university in 2009, uh, which was maybe a, a year after I finished high school. Uh, but I was still doing this gig, so I, I, I enrolled in USIU as a part-time student, which means I'd go to class between poof, five and nine, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a five, five yeah. 20 class, on yeah. that, and then another one at seven something, yeah. up until nine. So I'd do those classes in the evenings and on Saturdays. And the rest of the days I'd work. Uh, that's when I was boom swinging, being an extra on places. I started script writing in some instances. Mm -hmm. Then eventually my friend Dexter and I, Dexter, his name is Peter Ongogi, he's actually a successful filmmaker now. Mm -hmm. we, we set up our first company. Which, and the idea was, we, we met as extras on, on, on Nocturnal Junction. And the idea is, we, you know, we hung around a lot when you're an extra. Because you see, you're called only for your scenes. Then the rest of the time, you're basically just hanging around the film set. Mm -hmm. And you learn, you know, they, when the director, when they say cut, it means stop. When they say action, it means go. Yeah. So we had the basic stuff. We said we could teach this to primary school kids, no? And mm -hmm. then it sounds fun because you give them a boom and whatnot. So we set up this company to, to teach kids in primary school uh, basic film. Yeah. So we did this in McKinney School. We did this in St. Austin's and one more school that I can't remember right now. And we, we used to earn a bit of money, uh, which then I saved. I set up, in USIU, I set up something called the Game Court. Actually, I was there a 
maybe last year. And is the branding is still on. This Tots Road. Is yeah. It? Yeah, you know the back there? <laughs> yeah. Where they have the old restaurant? Yeah. But then there's, I think they use it to store Maka now. <laughs> You've seen it? It's more storage, yeah. Yeah, it's more yeah. storage. But that was my shop all the way back in 20, maybe 2011, 2013. 2011. Yeah. And we used to sell 50 book movies. I was a pirate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I should have seen the same stuff. Like <laughs> guys. And now yeah, you're on the other side of yeah. copyright. And then I had all these TVs, uh, maybe three or four of them and connected to Xboxes and PS5s, not PS3s at the time, mm -hmm. where guys would come and play FIFA and stuff. So then that money was saved as well. Um, and the first major production I did was Young Rich, which I started producing when I was still in school yeah. in 2012. Um, so that's where I got the money to answer your question. That was yeah. a long ass answer. And uh, on the Austins and McKinney gigs, which year was this? Um, St. Austin and McKinney must have been 2010, all, 2010. all through to 2012. Because I, I, all through this period, I was, I was, I never stopped working at any given yeah, point. Yeah. And how it would work in, in McKinney School and those schools is, the, you know how they have drama club and they have music mm -hmm. club? So then we'd only be slated on the days of sports stroke clubs, which would usually be Friday in most of the schools. And I think on, in, in, in Central State it was Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so you come in and you teach a class for an hour, which show them basic script writing, then at the end of the, of the, of the, of the term, they'd, they'd get a short film to take home. Mm -hmm. And they'd pay us 3,000 for the term. I think in McKinney School, the first, batch of students we got like 30 so this is 90k yeah, but, that's you, but divided by three months it's not as much as you think actually but i was saving most of this money walking yeah. from places to place like i remember i used to only take a photo from Rosambo to to the cbd mm -hmm. then walk all the way to mckinney school save 100 bob pile, pile up on it and eventually by the time i had to do a pilot so i had some money kept aside um and then i was able to get some support from friends as well because mm -hmm. i have two two friends who put in money early on but i had saved quite a bit as well over three years you can save quite a lot if you yeah. Go back, go back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm even asking the year for that because I went to St. Austin's at a point, mm -hmm. uh, but not 2010. 2010, okay. I was in class eight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Man, I'm great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, nah, not too much. Mm -hmm. Still around the same bracket. Yeah. But before we even get into Young Rich and production and all that, I want to go a bit into lifestyle because a lot of these play into come into play mm -hmm. in terms of achieving all the things that you have. Yeah. And I've been seeing on WhatsApp stories, on Instagram. You wake up at what time? You see you've been working out multiple times a week. Yeah. So I've always been working out for as long as I can remember, maybe the last five, six years. But mm -hmm. on and off, you know, like yeah. two days a week, three days a week. You know, when you're hangover, you know. Yeah, and you, you can't really. When you s yeah, yeah. So, but then last year I had a bit of a, of a reawakening. I want to take my businesses to the next level. I mean, before Corona happened, uh, yeah. I, had, I had the TV production company. Uh, I'm, in a, I'm in partnership on a farm that does beef lots, uh, mm -hmm. that does, sorry, beef, feed lots for beef in Isinia. Mm -hmm. um, we have the club number seven. So there was a lot that I wanted to do and I just realized I needed to, I wanted to dedicate myself entirely to, to, to the work. Because um, before that I was really, I was doing a lot of stuff. I was traveling the world, I was mm. having a lot of fun, partying. Yeah. Uh, but then there wasn't a lot of discipline. So now, f starting from December last year, I picked up a, a, a role which was, I was going to wake up every morning at, initially it was 4.30, now it's up to 4. Mm -hmm. So every single weekday, I'm up at 4 a.m. Um, I read for about an hour and a half. Okay. Uh, then I'm at the gym around 6.15, 6.20. Um, well, now the, because of Corona, it stopped for a while, but then now we work out here. I work out at a friend's private gym and sometimes here. Mm -hmm. I have a trainer I work out with every morning. So then we finish about, usually about 8. From 6.30 to about 8. Yeah. It's very intense. It's very, um, you've seen it. Yeah, I've seen I it. can send you some, some videos and stuff yeah. like this as well. Yeah. Uh, it's very intense. It's, 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 it keeps you alive, a lot of energy. Then after that, I basically have a full day of work for 12, 14 hours. Uh, I'm in bed by 9.30. Yeah, so you just want to be sharp mentally, physically, just be able to keep up with... Yeah, it's, so the, the thinking about the workout and the reading is, uh, every morning that you wake up, you've got you're going to war. The world is, a, mm. the way I think it is, an analogy. You're going to war. And what two weapons do you have on yourself? It's your brain and your body. Yeah. So if you keep those at top notch, the thing about working out is your feet, you, you've got energy. You can, I, can, I think I can attack anyone I know. Mm. Um, and the thing about reading, of course, is you also keep, uh, keep your mind uh, very, very alive. And not just reading, because the thing about now is you read a lot because of Twitter and things mm -hmm. like this, but it's short form content. So your brain doesn't really learn um, uh, analyzing uh, long stuff and understanding complex matters because you're always just consuming these little nuggets of information. Yeah. So they are making us dumber than as opposed to making us stupid, uh, uh, cleverer. Yeah. Um, so the thing that's, that's what I do with books, I think I read about 30 to 60 pages every morning. Okay. 
then work out for an hour and a half. I, I can imagine by the time I set up, I, set, I sit down at a desk and say you woke up at eight and you sit down at the same desk as me. We're not the same. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, I've created a system almost that makes me a machine just to deliver, 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 mm. deliver. And it's working, I like it. Productivity. Yeah. And speaking of books, I'm a big fan of reading myself. Mm. I mm. try at least knock out two, three books uh, a month. Yeah. My favorite being, at the moment, Ray Dalio's Principles. Yeah, I started uh, on this book. I haven't finished it though. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have a copy. I think I read up until 10, page 10 or something, but mm. I found a really intriguing quote in there okay. about, about this pandemic. And he was talking about the, the financial collapse of 1978. Mm. And he speaks about how maybe I'll find the book and read it for you because I don't I don't I don't want to yeah <laughs> to, to 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 dampen the the, the message yet. Mm -hmm. But you're telling me something about this book. No, yeah, and it's one of those that uh, it's split into two: work principles and, and then uh, yeah, and personal principles, and that systematic way of of identifying problems or errors and fixing them. Mm. I've really applied a lot of that into my own mm. thinking and life and it's like come as a direct almost like a bible mm. uh, type thing. Yeah. Do you have any of these books or any author that particularly directly affected how you? Way back I read Richard Dad Poor Dad and I know it's a lot of people think that book is cliche mm -hmm. but and it's because a lot of people just read the book and never implement what the yeah. book says yeah. because they're there's a bit of a disconnect about the understanding of what that is. But Rich Dad, Poor Dad really taught me the principle of money. Mm. Like what works, what is an asset, for example. And a lot of people think they have the knowledge, basic knowledge of how money works and they don't. Yeah. I read that book, I think I read it twice, thrice. Uh, I haven't read it of late because uh, since then I've, I've, I've sort of, my understanding of the matter has gone higher and I've read other books. But to start, that's a really, really good book. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, another book that I can think of now is The E-Myth. Uh, it's a very, very, if you already have a business going and you want to sort of grow it further, that's a very good book. Mm -hmm. There's a book I'm currently reading um, called The Deals That Changed the World. Oh, I am reading that as well, yeah, same time. It's a fantastic book. Yeah. I'm just about on the last chapter actually yeah. now. Mm -hmm. um, there's a book, um, which other book? Um, there's one I'm just about to start. I don't know if it'll change my life yet, but it's very, um, uh, what do you say? Very, very apt for these times. Mm -hmm. It's called why I don't why I'm not talking to white people. Why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. Mm. Um, I think I've seen the cover. Yeah. And the white. I think mm. they mm. played sure with the title be. somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, tell us. I'm seeing a lot of Mal Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, I mean, yes, yes, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh -huh. David and Goliath was a big one for me. Yeah, David and Goliath. I read the new one, uh, but for some reason it wasn't uh, Iliquatu. The one for strangers, how? Yeah, talking to strangers. Yeah, it's got a lot of interesting nuggets and stuff, but it uh, it didn't do it for me. I'd say David and Goliath was a big one for me. Okay. Because you know, David Goliath is about uh, the art of beating giants. Like, yeah. Um, the advantage of disadvantage. And and the argument is, you, we always look at disadvantage as a bad thing, like how you set out in life, whether you came from a poor background, whether you came from, um, like you so you throw some curveballs. We always look at that as a negative thing. But the book of the David and Goliath is really about. It's actually if you look at it, yeah. a lot of people who start out with a disadvantage end up. If you play it well, it ends mm -hmm. up working in your favor. And I started out as a disadvantage, which I guess why I like the book. So now I own my disadvantages. I think what I have on there is Marvin Gaye. Yeah, I don't think you'll be able to use that though in my show. I don't know. So I've got all these records, but I don't. I don't have. They're not arranged in any particular order. So on Friday evenings or so, we'll, I'll sit here for hours and hours finding a record and playing it. It's, I find that when you have physical things, and it's the same thing with even with the books, yeah. when there's something that has happened with music and books, because it's so easy to download one and, and just flip it through on your system, we, we, we've lost a bit of value for it. So, uh, one of the biggest reasons I started this is it's very personal. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a direct mentorship which can then be gotten by other people in yeah. their 20s especially. Yeah. And it's really targeted to people who are already ambitious. Um, and one of the biggest hurdles that I've had to uh, pass at the moment has been ageism almost. Mm -hmm. Anytime I enter a room with certain ideas and projects and plans, the second they realize this is someone who's in the early 20s, yeah. And you had to do this, of course, by the time you launched Young Rich, you were 23? Two. 22. No, maybe even younger. 20, yeah, 22. 22. So how was that negotiation process, that conversation? How do you go about it? 
Well, I was even worse than you. I had the, like, this short dreadlocks. You know how dreadlocks and they're coming yeah. up, they're ugly as hell? Yeah. I had that. Um, and I used to have these torn jeans and stuff because I didn't have clothes. Um, it's, I've always found with me that I always over-prepare for what I have uh, in, my, in my favor. So, like, any meeting I'd show up to, I'd, I'd come pretty well prepared. Mm. I speak well. Um, I found that this worked in my favor. Of course, there was always some places I couldn't uh, access because of my age. But the more I proved, um, it, w- it, was the pre- it was the preparation and the delivery. Mm-hmm. Because I, I very early on, I got, a, I got a reputation for being able to deliver always. Um, to this day, we have never missed TX is, um, TX in TV is the day that uh, the show broadcasts. Mm-hmm. We've never make, missed one TX date in seven years. And there's times we've been juggling four shows at the same time. We've never once missed a TX date. So we created a reputation of, 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 of um, reliability. Mm-hmm. Uh, with our work, you knew you'd get at least a certain level of quality. Uh, you knew we'd be straight with our communication. Because you know Kenya has a lot of this, takpigia, takpigia, yeah. or, or I'll, I'll call you tomorrow, yeah. Monday, or I'll deliver it on Tuesday, and then you don't. Mm-hmm. We really, w- I made it a culture of ours uh, as, a, as, a, as a business to always uh, be straight and narrow, because I was young. Yeah. So then what this did in, in exchanges, it doesn't matter, the older guys, so long as they had their bad habits, we still beat them at that. Mm. Um, what else worked in my favor in terms of age? To be honest with you, I also hired older people to work for me. Okay. So when things were, like for example, for Young Rich, when we were doing the show Young Rich, I wasn't the one who was calling the subjects. There was an older lady doing mm. this for me. Because then if you get called by a 22-year-old yeah. guy with takataka dreadlocks, <laughs> not so much. Yeah, yeah so I found, we found ways to go about it. Now, of course, it's not, now in my case, my age is celebrated, of course, yeah. as we said earlier, yeah. not anymore, yeah. because I'll be 13 a bit. <laughs> uh, so after Still a while, it became, I'm the young guy who delivers. So mm-hmm. then the, the, the age thing started work to work in my favor. I think by the time I was 25 or thereabouts, yeah. especially when I got to the top 40 and the 40 for the first time, yeah. a lot of things changed. Um, I was started to take seriously. My reputation taught, spoke for itself. And then you could see our work. Um, so then that started to change and age stopped being a, a disability. Yeah. It became something that works to my advantage. And even in that age group, uh, one of the uh, things we have to balance is being young and enjoying your age and also uh, performing exceptionally well in your mm-hmm. field. Mm-hmm. So that balance of like the parting and the work and of course like with Young Rich, uh, the money came in suddenly out of nowhere and you're enabled and you can now travel, you can do whatever you want. How do you strike that balance to make sure you don't really like lose the plot with, with yeah. business? At the beginning it was... It was a bit strange for me because the thing is I've, I was addicted to my work at the beginning. Yeah. So what I'd do is I'd party, yes. The lot of suffering was sleep mm. because I'd work yeah. the many hours that were required of me because at the time, of course, I had only a few people. So what means I'd be the camera guy, I'd be the director. Then I'd be editing in the evening as yeah. well. Then still go out to Barkers, Barkers of the place. Mm-hmm. Back then. Did you guys find Barkers? No. Ah, man, you don't know <laughs> what you're missing. <laughs> Barkers Wrestlers next to Havana. Do you know Havana? No Havana, yeah. That used to be Electric Avenue, so that whole street used to be clubs, 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 clubs yeah. everywhere. So it was so heavy that you just like pretty much party on the street, moving from place to place, yeah. and you find your classmates. Yes, you particularly was very. On Thursday, we had transportation from there to really? from Yes, and back. Yeah, <laughs> like there was a bus system. <laughs> so yeah, the, we we do a few hours of that, and then go back to sleeping for two, three hours, and then back to work again. Yeah. Of course, that's not that's not sustainable. How did I strike the balance? I, I guess for me it's because. From my background, I had no, there was no opportunity, there was no chance of going back there. Mm. Um, and, and I've always said, I'll, I'll either, for as long as I live, I'll either be rich or dead. Mm. So I guess that motivation sort of um, pushed me even harder. I, I somehow I struck a balance. The younger years were, were hectic. There were days I'd come straight from the club and go straight to work. Mm. Because the thing is, so long as you don't drop the ball on it. Yeah. But I think as you grow older, it also starts just to become tiring. Um, my interests also started to shift. Um, so now I'd say it's more travel. Yeah. I, I do party still every now and then, but of course now not with Corona. Yeah. But even when I do it now, it's, 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 it's productive. So you end up like, what I do, the, the, most of the people I party with or spend a good time with, I put people I also work with. Mm. So then it ends up being a working session as well, where you're still coming up with ideas, where you're still strategizing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So I don't know if I ever struck a balance. It's just, but I didn't drop the ball. So you didn't drop the ball. Yes, <laughs> it works. <laughs> and you even mentioned uh, the whole working and also socializing and partying with the people that uh, you're friends with. Mm. And the same thing I've really been applying is I've been very exact with the friend friend groups that I've mm. had. Mm. As you can see, everyone even here I've known personally before professionally. Yeah. But we're able to come together and and make something happen mm. and um, mm. 
just contribute to each other. You said even Nema yeah. for Hannah Swimwe, that's also a friend of mine who yeah. we converse at She's that level. Well. She's doing very well. And that always like seems to motivate me. Uh, you just stay on toes. If mm. I'm slacking, they'll yeah. let me know. Yeah. If they're slacking, I let them know. Yeah. How's it been like with, with your friends uh, from the beginning to now? Um, friendships have always been... So to start with, uh, I have two... Uh, I, told you, I mentioned to you about the two friends who put money mm. into my business. The first one is actually my oldest friend. I went to primary school with him. His name is Kennedy Moremi. Uh, and when I had... Then we, we went to primary school together and then university together. Um, and in uni, we started talking and then he would see me set up all these businesses. And one time I was setting up the game, the game court and mm. he said, you know, I want to put money in, but I don't know, let's see it first. And then when he took up and was selling stuff, he was really, he felt like he had left out because Ken is this guy who was, he's a bit liquid and likes to invest in things as a security on himself mm. because he wants to, it's basically typical how investors think. I want to put money, I don't want to do the work. Mm. And then if I make the right bets, I'll be rich forever. Yeah. So then he had this anger to put something, some money in me, which is what happened when I started Young Rich. Uh, him and my best friend at the time, Muchi. So what we did is we, um, I came up with a concept of paper and I wrote my idea. There was no company and mm. I, I located them each 5%, mm -hmm. 5% in exchange for 150K from each. Um, and that was that. And then we started. So they put the money into something that wasn't even uh, a business. Yeah. So you see how that comes into play, which is hence my statement when I said, if you don't <laughs> have any friends who can give you. And it's a joke. It's, it's a joke. It's a joke. I don't, what I mean is whoever your friends are, is yeah. they need to be able to support you in whatever way they can to help you follow it's your dreams. And not just them, but you you back as well. Yeah. Because there's also ways that I support my friends. Yeah. Um, I found then that since then, my friendships have, have evolved. Um, I now spend more time with my peers as opposed to my friends. Yeah. So like these are usually people I want to be like. People already doing stuff that I'm keen on doing. Um, and it's, it's usually a scary thing because you see as, as you grow older, like some of my friends now are in families, you know. Mm -hmm. They have kids and stuff. And I don't. So it's, well I have dogs, but <laughs> it's not the same. Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that would be taken very kindly <laughs> by the parents. Uh, but so I've seen that as I grow older and as I sort of unlock new levels, my friends also change in the same capacity. So mm -hmm. I'm hanging out with new people now who I, I consider more my peers than friends. But then I still have this close knit group of people who, who you know, the Mochi still and mm -hmm. my friend Austin and, uh, and there's a guy called Mohammed and there's a guy called Ken who I mentioned. So they're still my friends, but like the people I spend most of my time with now are my peers, not my friends. Yeah. yeah. And was was getting on the on the Forbes list a conscious uh, goal of yours before you ever did? No. Surprisingly, um, Fonobong, who writes, who is the one who compiles. Um, so I've been on two Forbes lists. There's Forbes Africa, mm -hmm. which I was on the cover mm -hmm. in 2017. But I was also the first time I was on Forbes was on Forbes Global. Okay. Uh, Forbes.com, uh, and it's the most pro 30 most promising entrepreneurs under the age of 30 in Africa. Mm -hmm. And the guy who composed the list, his name is Mfonobong. Mfonobong Sahe, he's Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And he and I had met when I was doing the show on Rich because he needed some leads mm -hmm. on, 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 on the list. And I would always like, he'd, he'd drop me a line from wherever he was in the world because he travels a lot, asking, can you give me more information about so and so? You, guy, you did an episode on so and so, could you send me a link? And that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Then one time he sent me a, an interview set. I was like, who is this for? Mm -hmm. And then it turned out it was for me. So that was, that was quite pleasant, mm -hmm. um, the first time that came out. And then, of course, now the next year, uh, Forbes Africa picked, it, picked, uh, picked up the story. And then um, uh, on in 2017, there were two Kenyans on the list. That's me and Zamir. Zamir Vaji is actually a neighbor down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and he runs, he runs an architecture firm. And both of us made to the cover. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you'll, you'll see it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. that's actually where I first heard your name. Oh. I came across on your Forbes. name on Forbes. You you read well. <laughs> it's because I had been on a bunch of other smaller, <laughs> and I can't mention them without being in trouble. Can yeah, no, nah, don't worry. It's a <laughs> it's a also free because show. I work for a lot of them. Yeah, but yes, uh, that's where I first uh, came across you, and I'm curious on to did life change significantly or deals change significantly from pre Forbes to post Forbes. I'd say the one that was most impactful for me was Top 40 under 40 yeah. in 2014. Because mm -hmm. see, then I was still very green. Yeah. I think I was, it was EM one and a half in, into business. And 
you know, photo footing the footy, you select, you nominate people. Mm -hmm. And I remember I'd been nominating my friend Dennis McCurry. Yeah. I nominated him like four times. My business mentor, Dennis McCurry. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a call from Business Daily asking about, again, asking about uh, setting up an interview. Mm -hmm. And the interview was set up, and I thought it was the interview me about Dennis McCurry. Mm -hmm. So I actually came up, I came, if you look at that picture, I came in an old shirt and stuff from the top 40 and the 40 interview. Because yeah. I generally thought it was, it was about Dennis McCurry. Mm -hmm. So to be on the same list as your business mentor, because he ended up being on the list and so did I. Yeah. And I think a bunch of other people that year, Churchill. Uh, I have a lot of people who were on that list that year are good friends of mine. Tushar Ketty was on the list that year. Mm -hmm. uh, that changed my life dramatically. Uh, because you see, I was an unknown entirely at the time. I had this one TV hit, one hit TV, Young Rich, mm -hmm. and hit is relative because it was, it was loud. Mm -hmm. I don't know, numbers wise, who knows. Um, so that, that gave me uh, some level of seriousness in the people I, I, I started interacting with because I've, first of all, I couldn't even make it to the award ceremony because yeah. I was out working in South Sudan. Okay. Uh, stuck in a place called uh, Yambio, which is a very small, like, it's crazy. You land on a football field. I was doing some training for entrepreneurship there. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't attend the, the gala, but everybody I ended up interacting with uh, for Top 40 40 really propelled me because I got this really um, experienced business people who were on the list as well, and they held my hand. I'm very good friends with most of them. Um, and then, of course, Business Daily is quite well consumed locally. Mm -hmm. So even lots of places, oh, you're the guy on Top 40 under 40. Everybody in the South mm -hmm. Top 40 under 40. Yeah. Um, so then, even on my email signature, you know, the fact that I had to afford in the 40, now my emails are being responded to, mm. let's say before 50% of my emails were getting responses, now mm. it was 30% was getting responses, 70 yeah. were. Because we'll take you a bit more seriously when, yeah. when that happens. When Forbes happened, I th it led to a misconception because everybody thinks I was on the Forbes list because I have a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so I found that Forbes, uh, both times, it, it propelled my. It probably my profile internationally, not so much locally. Mm. Locally, everybody misunderstands it. It's, it they think I'm just it's money now, which yeah. I'm not. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, globally, it's it's nice because you get to go to the Forbes convention every year. Uh, there's one in Johannesburg. There's one in in Israel. There's one in uh, the one that I go often in the states. There's one. There's been one in Boston. There's been one. Last year, I went to one in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And the kind of people who speak at these places, the kind of people you interact with, are poof, it's it's mind blowing. Because yeah. it's a global community of under thirty. So every list, because there's a European list, there's an African list, yeah, there's, a, there's an American list, there's an Asian list, there's an Asian list. You can all congregate for three days of, four days, of intense partying and intense learning. Yeah. So in the evenings, we've had everybody from Kendrick Lamar to, who else has performed that I have seen? I saw 21 Savage last year, mm -hmm. uh, Kelani. Um, so there's all of this interesting beautiful concerts and then the, the, the day you get to hear this fantastic speakers serena williams spoke last spoke mm -hmm. last year uh, some big nba players as well you have activists coming you have top business people it's it's quite something so that that, that that's i feel like it's a community I, I i really i'm happy to belong to um but yeah of course and with, with these things also it helps with your profile yeah because again people take you more seriously if you've been acknowledged by especially foreign media yeah and yeah, so there's been Forbes, I think I've been on BBC, I've been on the Sydney, Sydney Morning Herald, I've been on Al Jazeera, it's, it's, so it helps, yeah, yeah. it helps with, with, with the profile. But I'd say the most significant was probably Top 14. Top 40, 40. the this, timing even. This daily timing. Yeah. Timing, Ben Sol. <laughs> Shout out Ben Sol. Um, you have, uh, you have, you seem to be big on mentorship and mentoring. And I think, uh, who did you partner with for, for Young Rich? I didn't partner with anybody for Young Rich. I had I had uh, investors. You had investors. I had, I had shareholders, but I, it was it was a gig that I ran. Yeah, and you have um, a, a friend, a business partner. His name is I think it's McCurry. Dennis McCurry. Dennis McCurry. Dennis McCurry is my business mentor. Is your business mentor? Yeah. yeah. How did what made him get interested in mentoring you? Was it just like something that happened naturally, or was it like yo I need? No. So I met Dennis McCurry when I was doing uh, his episode on Young Rich. Yeah. And he was. He was the first billionaire on the show because mm -hmm. the, who we thought was the first billionaire ended up being a scum. So Dennis McCurry was the first billionaire on Young Rich. And mm -hmm. I remember we, we spent quite a bit of time because he wanted to... Dennis is very meticulous in how he does things. So why else... It, you know, Young Rich was very much interviews like this mm -hmm. where you sit down for two hours and then they give you uh, pictures and stuff. Uh, but Dennis McCurry went the extra mile. Uh, he wanted to, to go down and show us his... Like when he studied about a, school, a primary school, he wants to show you the primary school. Mm -hmm. So we ended up traveling and going to Kisi for a couple of days. 
and I really found the man intriguing and his story. Uh, I mean, his father was a tout, and his his mom was a was a farmer, um, and and he went to you know he studied really hard and he went to uh, Moy University and learned taught himself how to code. Mm. And he was among the first people. You know, when you, when you used to call people and hear ringback tones. You still do. Yeah. Or when you call, thank you for calling John. Did you know mm -hmm. John means that's still his service? And at some point, they had four million subscribers each paying a shilling a day. See? <laughs> okay. It's crazy numbers. Yeah. And I found him very, very intriguing. So during the process of going through the episode of Young Rich, he also wanted to see the episode before it aired. Mm. We ended up uh, getting a friendship. And I, I, I actually asked him if he could be my mentor. Mm. And he said, uh, what does it mean? Of course, I said, I want to be meeting you every so often because I have all this bunch of questions. And of course, the thing about, uh, the thing about when you ask someone to be your mentor, it's always, even, even for me, I, it's always something you're not really... Because what most people are usually asking you is that you help them with their business. Mm. They're not asking for mentorship. They're asking for help with their business. They want you to be making decisions for them mm. and, and, and injecting money and stuff. Yeah. But for me, I generally just had questions. And so he was kind enough to allow me. And I think the first few interactions set him up, set it up well because we ended up becoming proper, like to this day. Mm. I think actually during the pandemic now, he's been seated where you were sitting and I was seated over there mm -hmm. uh, discussing what, what it means for, for business now during the pandemic because he also lives down the road and he came by one night for dinner. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, and he's been my business mentor since. I have many more others since, uh, but Dennis was, was my first business mentor and, and, and to this day, I still call on him for, for a lot of advice. Uh, the good thing is we've ended up now doing some things together. Mm -hmm. um, he ran for political office in South Mugirango, and I, I was involved quite a bit in the campaign. He's going to run again. I think he might one day be Kenya's president. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sounds so. Do you have any people you're mentoring, or not actively? Not actively. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the way I do mentorship now is through interviews like this, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Um, I speak at a lot at universities a lot. Um, there's some people who I have allowed direct lines to me to call directly when they have questions. But as I mentioned, I found that a lot of people who ask for mentorship are not asking for mentorship, they're asking mm. for help in their business. Yeah. And she's the thing, I'm running my own. Yeah. Uh, because see, I'm not... Like Dennis, for example, he was at the point where he's he's retired already. Mm. Like he's 30-something now, but at some point he already retired yeah. or something else. So he has a bit more time on his hands. I have to put in 14-hour work days. Uh, so it's, uh, I might not be very able to participate when someone wants... They basically want someone to run the business with them as opposed to, to mentorship. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So you've had a lot of a uh, lot of success and a lot of wins. Um, where have you dropped the ball or were confident about so a deal, a project, and things just didn't turn out how you expected? Has that happened? Yeah, quite a lot. There's 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 a lot of small ones yeah. and one big one. Okay. The small ones are I think for every TV show I create, maybe only f out of ten you guys get to see six, okay. you know, or maybe five. So I have a lot of dead TV shows mm -hmm. that never went anywhere. Although I don't like to call them that because there's a show I created in 2014 and it only went on air in 2019, five years later. Mm -hmm. So maybe my, my dreams are valid. Maybe. <laughs> so yeah, there's yeah. a lot of stuff that I try and fail. I, I, fail, I failed at, I started farming beans once, I failed terribly. Mm -hmm. I had tractors at some point that didn't work out because I partnered with, with relatives and they ran it down. Um, of, yeah, there's small, small ones, but the biggest one, some partners and I own, own a club called Number 7 in, in the CBD. Mm -hmm. And the idea for this when we started out was, I think we started this three years ago, three or four years ago is when we started the business. And the idea was to grow it into a chain of about 14, the, the target was 14, and then flip it. Mm -hmm. Now we started, of course, the first one, very successful. Opened from day one, it was full. Mm -hmm. Now there's a quote that success tricks smart people into thinking they can't lose. That's exactly what happened to me. Because we went bullishly into the next one, I think of less than a year after we had opened the first one. Poof, got a space, powered a bunch of millions into it. And we opened, no, first I traveled, because mm -hmm. that's how cocky I was. <laughs> you even went. Yeah, I left <laughs> for a bunch of weeks as we were constructing it. I went on holiday in Europe. Ah, man. Monaco? No, no. actually, it's <laughs> Central Bay. Okay. Take a <laughs> and I came back, and we, sat, we opened the place. And we had done everything wrong from location, with the furniture to and the place just never picked up not mm. once and even after we had learned that we had already messed up we, we stayed a bit and this was mostly me because I was I'm, I'm usually the bullish one in the in any partnership because yeah. I have like let's go now let's go yeah. now you know? um, so we we lost that 
six months in, I think we stayed a bit longer because of my ego wouldn't allow me to shut down mm-hmm. the place because, you know, you think it was, you're so smart that you could still turn it around. So that was quite a, a humbling loss. It, it, it hit me quite hard. Uh, but lessons learned. It was a very, that was, I think, the biggest uh, fumble I've done so far. Mm-hmm. But there's, there's a quote, there's a, it says there's a right way to fail. It's quickly, cheaply, and never the same way twice. So yeah, that's never happening again. Yeah. And I'm never going to St. Tropez again. <laughs> Although, no, I don't, I don't know if I want to commit to that, <laughs> that last one. <laughs> 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 Might see you there in a short No, I still don't. Central Pay did nothing wrong in this, in this situation. It's the timing. Yeah, timing. <laughs> Papa Soul. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I guess uh, to, to finish, to wrap this up, um, uh, with the title being Legacy, what do you have in mind moving forward? You said you want to really dedicate and focus on your businesses. Yeah. Of course, you're just 30, so you have a lot of runway ahead. Uh, to be honest with you, I think my legacy will be on the TV side. The business, because I'm, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm, I have my hands on a lot of things yeah. um, business-wise. But I feel, like, I feel like my true legacy will be, will be the stories I tell uh, with the TV shows. Now, if you look at the history of all my TV shows, I don't know how many of them you know, you will see that each one of them is always about positivity in Africa. And yeah. So like Young Rich was about putting forward this young African entrepreneurs who nobody thought existed. Yeah. Get in the Kitchen was about patriarchy. We were poking fun at the fact that African men don't yeah. cook and we were getting all these women to, to write in and nominate their African husbands to come in and get in the kitchen. And thousands of women wrote. And mm. for four years, this thing was on, on TV every week. And you should see that position we get mm. and how many homes this changed and how many mindsets. And after that, there was Story Young, which um, is to celebrate Kenyan heroes, you know, from yeah. the Jeff Quinangas to the Aida Dingers to... Kimboi to, um, we did a lot of people. Dr. Betty Konyo here who founded the Karen Hospital. Mm-hmm. And, and we're actually shooting season four of this series now, celebrating mm-hmm. great Kenyans who've contributed, who've contributed heavily to, uh, to our country. Then there was our perfect wedding, which celebrates, um, um, you know, the, the cultural nuances of, of African weddings. There's Foods of Kenya, which we've gone really heavy into celebrating uh, African food. and. And there's, uh, there's two TV shows coming, by the way, in, okay. in about, uh, in a few weeks' time. Mm-hmm. These are entirely new for the times. Um, and the thing about all these shows, it's about celebrating ourselves and, and, and showing us that... Because there's been this mental brainwash that has happened with Africans, where we've always thought that West is best. And this is because the media we consume, the stories yeah. that are told about Western. us, are told from someone else's perspective. Yeah. So the more we tell these story, Kenyan stories and the positive ones, the more I'm realizing how important it is, the role we play. And I think I want to do this more and more and more and more and, and take it to, uh, to a global stage in the sense that and we're not making this story to change the perception of, of, this, of, their, of themselves to us. We're making this story to change the perception of us to ourselves. To ourselves yeah. Because you see, if you feel confident, if you know you're, you belong, if you're proud of your food and your culture, it becomes easy. Someone said, if, if there's no enemy within, the enemy we thought can do you no harm. But the problem is with us, we hate ourselves already. We already think of ourselves yeah. as, as inferior. So when racism comes, it just wipes you out entirely. You're losing the battle before you even start. So I think like, I hope that my legacy will be to take these African stories that we tell and propel them higher and higher to, to a level that someone who's, who's young now can look back and go like, you know, I appreciate my food now because I saw, I saw foods of Kenya. Um, I, I became an entrepreneur because I saw young rich and it showed me that young people can, can get into business. And so on and so forth. So I feel like this ultimately will be my legacy. Okay. All right. That's what I'd want my legacy to, to be. be. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this. And uh, as a fun fact, you have a very big reason as to why this is even happening mm-hmm. uh, in the first place as a producer uh, myself. So thank you for your time. You're welcome. Yeah, I've learned a lot. I was supposed to read your quote from that book. Yeah. Can I find it? Yeah, you can. Be on my phone. You so he's talking about the the financial crash of 1970, not in 1978. So to try, he says, to try and understand what was happening, I spent the rest of that summer studying past currency devaluations. I learned that everything that was going on, the currency breaking its link to gold and devaluing, the stock market soaring in response had happened before. And the logical cause effect relationship made those developments inevitable. My failure to anticipate this, I realized, was due to by, was due to my being surprised by something that hadn't happened in my lifetime, though it had happened many times before. The message that reality was conveying to me was you better make sense of what has happened to other people in other times and other places because if you don't know, you won't know if these things can happen to you and if they do, you won't know how to deal with it.